I want to welcome all of you this morning. It's great to see you gathered for the worship of our God. And as you can see, because of the table set in front of us here, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper today and remembering the great work our Lord Jesus Christ accomplished through His suffering and death for us. Now let's take our Bibles and turn in the New Testament to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. The book of Ephesians, chapter 1. This letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus. And in the opening verses, the Apostle lays out for us the plan of God for our salvation. Ephesians, chapter 1. And we'll begin reading at verse 1 down to verse 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. And so here is a wonderful reminder of our salvation accomplished by the three persons of the Trinity and that it might be all to the praise of His glory. And that's why we're here this morning because He has saved us by this very plan, and we're here to give Him the honor and the glory. Well, let's pray together and ask for the help of our God. Our Father, we are here before You this morning, and we would worship You for this great plan of salvation that You have worked out. Thank You, our God, that from all eternity, You are the great architect, the planner of our salvation. Thank You that in the midst of human history, You sent Your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to accomplish it by His work in life and in death. Thank You that He was willing to suffer and die in our place. And how we rejoice that You have sent Your Holy Spirit to accomplish this plan in our hearts. Thank You that He has brought us to know Christ. Thank You that He has worked in our hearts repentance and faith. Thank You, our God, that He continues that work, even causing us to anticipate the glory that is coming in the future. Our God, we are here to thank You and to praise You for all that You have done. What a great and glorious God You are, higher than the heavens, and yet You are willing to condescend and meet with Your people here today. Please help us and strengthen us. 
Grant our God that not merely with our lips, but from the depths of our souls, we would bring to you the praise that you deserve. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our red hymn books now and turn to the back cover and sing this theme that uh, Paul has been articulating to the praise of His glorious grace. The back cover of the red hymn books to the praise of His glorious grace.
Well, please keep your red uh, hymn books in hand and turn to number 175. And here we're reminded of our Lord Jesus Christ coming into the world as the Lamb of God and His purpose in order to die for sinners. Hymn 175 in the red hymn book, Look, the Lamb of God. Now let's take our Bibles again and turn to the final chapter, Revelation 22. Sometimes people are disappointed when they get to the end of a book and the final chapter and Uh, It doesn't end really the way they wanted it to end. Well, for the believer, this is the most glorious ending that we could ever learn about as we think about what God has planned for His people in eternity. In chapter 21, we're reminded that at the end of this world, God is going to renovate and bring about new heavens and a new earth. And there will be a new city, the new Jerusalem, which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, symbols to represent the glory of God dwelling in the midst of His people. And here in chapter 22, we're given more details, symbols, to help us to understand what this wonderful place will be like where we'll dwell for eternity. Let's read together Revelation 22. Please follow along in your Bibles. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. 
Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers the prophets and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The Spirit and the bride say, Come. Come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. So here at the beginning of the chapter, we're reminded of the wonderful paradise taken away from Adam and Eve in the beginning of the Bible and now restored to God's people. There's no barrier to the tree of life, nothing to keep us away from all of the blessings that God has provided. And in this picture, as John describes it for us here, we have the throne of God, and coming out of the throne is this stream, the water of life. That's simply a symbolic picture to remind us that as in this life, so in eternity, all of the blessings we enjoy come from God Himself. Now, John concludes the chapter, concludes the Bible here, with some very important reminders. First of all, the importance of the Word of God. If you're going to be found in heaven, you're going to be a person of this book. And you're going to treat it with great reverence. You won't come to passages and say, oh, I don't like this, I'm going to ignore that. Or you're not going to add your own message like some of the cults have done over the years. You're going to come to the Scriptures and you're going to say, I believe this is the Word of God and by His grace and power, I'm going to live by it. Those are the kind of people who are going to be found in heaven. Another very important truth 
that is brought forward here at the very end of the Bible. It's the invitation of the Gospel. One more time, as it were, before the end, God gives this invitation. If anyone is thirsty, if anyone recognizes the need of his soul, come to Jesus Christ and drink. Right up until the end, God keeps offering His mercy to sinners and a wonderful Savior. And we're going to keep proclaiming that message until the trumpet sounds and our Lord Jesus returns. And then this wonderful encouragement. Stirring up in our hearts longing for this future eternal experience. You can almost see John. Lord, when is it going to happen? How soon can we expect it to come? Even so, come Lord Jesus. I'm coming soon. Yes, Lord Jesus, come soon. May God use His Word and even this testimony from Revelation to stir within our hearts a longing for that trumpet to sound and the clouds to break apart and the Lord Jesus to come in His glory. Is that the yearning of your heart? Brethren, often our problem is we've gotten too wedded to this world. We're enjoying things down here far too much. Oh yes, God has given us all things richly to enjoy, but if those things that we enjoy richly overwhelm a longing for the return of Christ, we're too wedded to this world. So just look at the meter in your heart this morning, and where is it on the scale? Is it with great longing that you want Christ to return? How we need to pray for the Spirit's work in our hearts. This morning we want to pray for the family conference in Australia that Berean Bible Church is um, sponsoring. And as if you were with us on Wednesday night, you know that at the very last minute, uh, because of a spike in COVID numbers, they had some restrictions brought on them. State borders were closed, so some of the people planning to come couldn't come. Their preacher because of those state border closures, couldn't come. And if you want to panic a pastor, tell him that in three days he's got to cover all of these messages. And then at the last moment again, a mask mandate came down. And so Pastor Kane was uh, worried that this was going to put a great damper on the conference. Well, let's pray that they would be knowing God's blessing in these days. Then continue to pray for the mission in the Far East. The warfare has increased again, as well as many deaths from COVID. They don't have medications in the country, health care to help the people, and so we want to remember that. And then also, um, Al and Pat were planning to be here this morning, and Al messaged me, Uh, Pat had a difficult night and was having a hard time breathing. So we want to remember them in prayer as well. Well, let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, give us grace to be faithful to Your Word right to the end. Not to add to it, not to take away from it, but to take all of the Scriptures believing that You have given them to us so that we might know how to live to Your honor and glory in this world. Please give us grace to be faithful. And through the ministry of Your Spirit, as we read the Scriptures, would You stir in our souls a great longing for all that You have planned in the future, especially for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. May it be our greatest joy to think about seeing our Savior face to face. Our Father, we would bring to You the family conference in Australia. And how we ask our God that despite all of the things that have happened in just the last few days, 
that you would come to them with great blessing. Father, thank you for the 120 to 130 who are planning to be there. Father, meet with those people in a wonderful way. Bless your word. Encourage their souls. Father, as they come from several different churches that are normally a great distance from each other, may they be encouraged to know that they have brethren in many places who are committed to living out the Scriptures. Father, we think of the work in the Far East. We can scarcely imagine the great difficulties as they are hunkered down in that compound with the gates closed, seeking to keep out not only warfare, but disease. Father, thank You for the safety that they have that in these weeks and months, No one has died. We pray, our God, that You would continue to watch over them, supply all of their needs. Father, we pray that Your Gospel might continue to work in that compound as the leaders talk to the children and to the young people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we also would lift up Pat to You this morning. You know exactly what's going on, what might be wrong. Give them wisdom whether they need to go to the clinic or not. Father, grant much help. And by the end of this day, may Pat know much relief from what she's been experiencing. Father, thank You that You've allowed us to be here. And we would hunger for Your presence, Your work in our lives. Help us as we come to this table to remember the Lord Jesus. We haven't had this blessing for a long time. Oh, that we might know wonderful fellowship with our Savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's take our blue hymn books and turn to number 133 as we think of what our Savior has done for us and our desire to praise His great name. The text from Acts chapter 3, the miracle of the healing of the paralyzed man. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Hymn number 133. Before we read the Word of God, let's again pray 
and seek God's help for what we're about to do. Our gracious God, we bow before You and we ask that You would help us that the words we've just been singing would be the desire of our hearts, that we would recognize how much the Lord Jesus has done for us, and our response be this wonderful desire to praise Christ here in this world and then through the days of eternity, that we might join that heavenly choir in wonderful anthems to our Savior. Our Father, as we open Your Word together this morning, we confess how much we need the ministry of Your Holy Spirit. And how we pray He would come with great power. And that He would enlighten our minds. And that He would give us understanding. And He would grab hold of our hearts. And we would rejoice together to have a Savior who loves us a Savior who laid down His life for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a tendency to think that the good news, the Gospel, is just for unbelievers. Of course, we know that we need to know it to be able to tell others who need to hear it, But once we're saved, many Christians think that we're basically done with the Gospel. But that couldn't be further from the truth. A Christian needs to know the Gospel intimately for himself. The message of Christ suffering and dying on the cross isn't simply good news for unbelievers who need to be saved. It's also good news for believers who gradually discover how difficult it is to live the Christian life. We definitely can't do it on our own. If you try, you'll just fall flat on your face. The Lord Jesus suffered and died not only to forgive us of our sins, but also to enable us to live for God as faithful disciples. So this morning, we're going to consider the good news, the gospel, from that perspective. That it's good news for believers. It's good news that we need every day. May it be just that to us. Good news that cheers our hearts and enables us to live to the glory of God. Now, we can't possibly consider this morning every example that the Bible gives to us, but we'll look at some prime illustrations of the necessity of the Gospel in the lives of believers. So, we begin, first of all, with this truth. Good news for believers, the Gospel empowers us in our struggle with sin. The Gospel empowers us in our struggle with sin. Now when a sinner comes to Christ in repentance and faith, sin in their lives is dealt a powerful blow. All of our sins are forgiven because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Its reigning power in our lives is destroyed. It cannot control us any longer as it once did. But it's not gone. In the wisdom of God, our sin nature is left within us causing a struggle. What the Bible calls a warfare, a battle. And it will be there until the day that we die and are taken to heaven as perfected saints. It's one of the hardest lessons for young Christians to learn and all believers to remember that this life has the nature of an ongoing battle with sin. It's in the context of this great realism about the Christian life that the Gospel is good news for believers. 
It empowers us to deal with the remnants of sin in our lives. Now I want you to turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 7. Paul's letter to the church at Rome chapter 7. And we're just going to read the concluding verses of the chapter. Romans 7, beginning at verse 21. Paul, in speaking of himself, says, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Now here in Romans 7, Paul is giving something of a personal testimony of how he came to be converted to the Lord Jesus Christ and of the reality of the ongoing struggle with sin in his life. And in these verses that we've just read, he describes a Christian as a person who has two laws operating within him. There's the law of God, which commands him to do what is right. But then there is this law of sin, which commands him to do what is wrong, which wants to take him away from obedience to God's law. And Paul, in the description, shows us that these two laws are at war with each other. There's a battle going on in the life of the believer, a spiritual tug of war. So as Paul says, I often don't do what I want to do. He wants to do right and follow God's law, but this law of sin is right there urging him to do what is evil. The battle, as he describes it here in these verses, is often overwhelming. It made the apostle desperate at times, so desperate that he cried out in agony with words like this, O wretched man that I am! Now he knew that he had been saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew that he was a child of God. He knew that he had been given the gift of eternal life. And yet as he saw this battle, this warfare going on within him, he says, I'm a wretched man. And who's going to deliver me from this battle, from this warfare? He knew that as long as he was in this body, in this world, that the struggle would be ongoing. And so he looked to the future. He looked to deliverance. When Christ would come and rescue him from the struggle with sin, which is part of life in this world for the Christian. Now if you're a Christian this morning, and you've been walking with the Lord for any amount of time, you know the reality of what Paul is speaking about here. This isn't something strange to you. You've known the struggle with sin. You've known the heartache of dealing with something like anger in your life. Falling into its trap. Losing your cool. And then looking at shame with yourself. Asking the questions, how could I do that? I profess to be a Christian, a child of God. How could I lose my temper like that? Or you may know the grief of struggling with lust, of making efforts to put it to death, of making strides in the right direction, only to have it pop up right in front of you with unbelievable force and lay you in the dust. Paul wants to remind us to the Christian who knows the reality of this struggle with sin, 
the gospel is incredible news. For in the midst of his grief, as he cries out, O wretched man that I am, he's able to go on and recognize that the gospel leads us to proclaim victory. Who will deliver us? Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the gospel that gives us deliverance. It's the gospel that gives us power over sin. Not only does God in the Gospel wash us clean from all of our sins, He empowers us. He enables us to say no to sin and yes to righteousness. The Gospel picks us up when we have fallen down and enables us to stand and go on to serve Christ. Not only do we need the Gospel to begin the Christian life for conversion, We need the Gospel to live the Christian life. We need the Gospel every day. Every day we need to be looking to Christ and asking Him to give to us the fruits of His suffering. That the power of His cross would be evident in our lives as we go through these battles with sin. So the Gospel is good news for believers as we face this struggle with sin. But then the second truth the Bible brings to us. Good news for believers, the Gospel enables us to have marriages that honor God. The Gospel enables us to have marriages that honor God. Now, when a marriage lasts a long time and is truly a blessing to husband and wife, it doesn't just happen. That's not just an accident. Rather, it's a testimony that the gospel has been uh, at work in the lives of that couple. Many marriages only have an external veneer. On the outside, people might look and think, well, that's a happy marriage. But on the inside, when the front door is shut and no one is at home but husband and wife, reality shows a far different picture. I think it would be true to say that most couples enter into marriage with the confidence that it's going to work. They have no idea of future troubles And certainly not that their marriage could ever end in divorce. But the truth of the matter is that every marriage begins with trouble built in. As one well-known book title puts it, a marriage takes place when sinners say, I do. That's the reality of married life. Now, We wonder, if God created marriage to be a blessing, how can we ensure a good outcome? How can we make sure that we don't add to the shocking divorce statistics? Well, the Bible would tell us every couple needs the Gospel. Every couple needs the power of the cross in their relationship. The good news of Jesus Christ is the marriage manual that we need. Often young couples, as they're getting married, they they want to read this book and that book. What manual will really help us to move forward? And if any of those books are good, what they're going to do is send you back to the Bible because the Bible gives us God's answers to the problems that are always cropping up in marriage. Well, let's turn to a really familiar passage. Ephesians chapter 5. We started with this morning to this very familiar part of the Bible. Ephesians 5, and let's begin at verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. 
Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her, that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word, so that He might present the church to Himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, what is so important about this text that we've just read here this morning is that in teaching us about marriage, the Apostle Paul puts the Gospel right in the middle of the marriage relationship. To a husband and wife, Paul would say, If you want to know how to relate to one another properly, you need to understand the Gospel. You've got to look at the relationship of Christ and His church. This declaration that we have here in verse 25, as Paul exhorts husbands to love their wives, is one of the most beautiful Gospel statements in all of the Bible. That the Lord Jesus Christ came and He laid down His life for His bride, the church. So if you're going to have a successful marriage, you've got to keep your eyes focused on Christ and on His sacrifice. You have to keep visiting Calvary day after day to see Jesus suffering and dying for you and understand from that the lessons that need to be applied to your marriage. That will teach you to love sacrificially. To lay down your life. To lay down your will to lay down your opinions and your desires. That will remind you about forgiving your spouse even when you'd rather be angry with him or her. That will fix in your mind that it's not all about you. It's how you're caring for the other person. That view of the sacrifice of Christ will help you to establish in your home the things that are important like reading and praying together and recognize that the great issues are not which way the roll of toilet paper goes on the holder. When the Gospel becomes central in a home, it makes it a sweet place to be. When even one of the partners is not a Christian, The Bible encourages us to know that the presence of a Christian in that home can have a tremendous impact. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul encouraged people who had been converted and yet their spouse was still not a Christian to stay in that marriage if the other partner was willing to stay as well. He spoke of great blessing coming into the home because of the presence of a believer even the potential of God's salvation coming to the spouse or to the children because one of them had been converted. So very clearly, Paul wants us to understand that the Gospel can make inroads into places that look impossible to us. Because the Gospel is good news for marriages. Now, the third thing for us to consider this morning, and the last major thing, as we think about good news for believers, the Gospel provides a roadmap for church life. The Gospel provides a roadmap for church life. 
The church of the Lord Jesus Christ should be the most glorious society in the world. When you think of people getting together, well, people get together at work, people get together at school, people get together in their neighborhoods, people get together for sports events and music celebrations, those things are starting to happen again. People get together as a church. And when you compare the church to all of those other gatherings, even family gatherings, the church ought to be the most glorious society that mankind knows. After all, it's made up of people who have been transformed by the grace of God, who have known the impact of the cross of Christ in their lives. Together, they're traveling to heaven. And their united existence is to give a regular foretaste of the things we've been reading in the book of Revelation. So, in essence, we're saying, if you want to know what heaven is like, come to church and experience church life. That's to be a foretaste of all that God has planned. But as we all know, at times, the church may be the last place that you really want to be. That's a sad confession, but that's reality. It simply underscores the truth of our first heading, that though we are saved, we're, we're still sinners. And that sin is often experienced in the church. More often than we're willing to admit, our sin breaks out into the open and impacts our relationship with our fellow travelers to heaven. As one preacher put it, there's enough gunpowder left in all of these hearts to blow the church sky high. When that happens, it's a powerful testimony to the fact that we've gotten our eyes off the gospel. No matter what other explanation might be given, when a church is in the midst of problems like that, we've gotten our eyes off the gospel. Our obvious need then is to keep our eyes fixed on this good news not just as a means of saving sinners, but for the life of the church. Week after week, as we meet together, we need to be looking to Jesus. Not merely praying that He would save sinners. Yes, we pray that. And not merely asking that God would bring blessing out into the world where there's so much curse. But that God would work in these hearts and that sin would be mortified, and that we'd be growing in grace, and that our bonds of unity would become stronger and stronger and stronger, so that people would look at us, and just like they did with the apostles say, those people have been with Jesus. Those people have their eyes on Calvary how we need to be remembering week after week the work of Christ on the cross for us and praying that His grace that flows from His glorious redemptive work would be helping us as a church to live to the glory of God. Not long ago, as we were making our way through Colossians 4, the early section of that chapter, we heard Paul's teaching on the church, particularly the kind of life that is to mark our relationships, putting off sins, growing in virtues and graces. And if you remember, it was all rooted in the Gospel. It was all because of the new life we have in Christ, looking to Christ in heaven, that we're to go on and deal with our sins and to grow in graces. 
Our life as a church is meant to flow out of the reality of the great change that has taken place in our lives because we're united with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's briefly look at a couple of other passages that make this point clear, that the Gospel is the road map for the church. Turn back to the book of Romans, chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, we'll just read the first three verses. Romans 15 and verse 1. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Now here Paul is addressing the touchy subject of Christian liberty. The acknowledgement that there are areas where Christians may have some serious disagreements. Areas where God has not given us clear commandments in His Word. Here in the church at Rome, it seemed that there was something of a battle between people who had been converted out of a Gentile background and people who had been converted out of a Jewish background. And so the great question was, do Christians need to keep the Old Testament ceremonial laws? In other words, something practical like this, should you eat certain meats? Should all Christians eat pork? Now Paul knew that those Jewish laws no longer had any application to the lives of Christians. But he also knew that not all Christians, especially those from Jewish backgrounds, understood that. And so, how should they handle that issue of eating pork? Should they just force the issue on everyone? Should they have a church supper and serve pork so that as every member of the church goes down the buffet table, there it is, staring them in the face? No. What Paul does in answering the question is he points to the Gospel. You've got to understand the Gospel to deal with issues like this. What does he say about the Gospel? Well, he says... Christ didn't come to please Himself. Now you just think about that for a minute. When Christ left the glories of heaven and the honor that He deserved there and humbled Himself to come down into this world and to take on human flesh to be a creature, was He pleasing Himself? <laughs> Not at all. How about when at the end of his life and ministry, he chose to go to the cross? He voluntarily submitted himself to the suffering that those Roman soldiers gave him and to all of the filthy labels and condemnation that they put upon him. And then going to the cross to be nailed there to that wood and to hang between heaven and earth and suffer and die. Did He do that to please Himself? And so, Paul says, you've got to look at Christ. You've got to know how He behaved. That's how you're to behave. You don't say as a believer, well, I like pork, so I'm bringing pork to the church supper when you know it's going to offend somebody. You don't live to please yourself in the church. You ask the question, how can I please my brother? How can I please my sister? How can my actions and my words and my attitudes do them good? It's about bringing the Gospel and practically applying it to our church life. One more passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 
2 Corinthians 8, and we're going to read here verses 6 to 9. 2 Corinthians 8, and we'll just break into the passage at verse 6. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 6, Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that you by His poverty might become rich. Now, here in chapter 8 and 9, Paul is taking up this subject of Christian giving. And it has a particular focus. There were great needs in the church in Jerusalem across the Mediterranean Sea. Famine had struck Israel. And so many of the poor people in the church in Jerusalem were suffering. They didn't have enough money to buy food. And so the churches throughout the Roman Empire were taking up an offering and sending it to them. And it seems like from what Paul has to say here, the Corinthians, even though they'd agreed on the previous visit of Paul that they would participate in this offering they were dragging their heels. And so Paul sends Titus to encourage them in this ministry to take up the offering and to bring it along. And what does he use to motivate them? Well, he uses the Gospel. He says, remember Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for our sakes He became poor, so that we, through His poverty, might become rich. The Gospel will help you to understand how you should participate in believers in the financial support of the ministry of Christ's church. Now, many other passages in the New Testament could be referred to that show how the Gospel is to be applied to church life. How it becomes a roadmap for us. The church is to have the smell of the Gospel. In every aspect of our life together, this work of Christ to suffer and die for us, for poor lost sinners, is to guide us, motivate us, strengthen us for this glorious work of being together the temple that God wants to dwell in for His honor and glory. So the Gospel is not just good news for unbelievers, it's good news for believers. And may our God help us to hold on to it with a bulldog determination that we will never be moved from it. Not only to know it and to make sure it's preached among us, but that it will be guiding us and directing us in our lives as Christians. That we will be people who are ready to tell others about this good news and that they will see in our lives that it's changed us that we're living by the good news. Dear brethren, how important is the good news to you? Well, let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, Thank You for Your Word where You've made these things plain to us. And even though we've considered things here this morning not new, yet how often do they get put on the back burner and we're not thinking consciously week by week, day by day, about the Gospel in our lives as believers or in our marriages or in our life together as a congregation. Please, our God, will You help us. And even use this Lord's Supper this morning 
as we come and consider the symbols that are before us of our Savior's suffering and death to be reminded of its great importance in our lives as individuals and as a body of believers. May the Lord Jesus be honored and glorified in what we're about to do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.